Welcome to Take Off, a podcast by 10X Travel. Today on the show, you've got myself, Bryce Conway, Emily, Matt, Travis. We'll be coming to you regularly to chat points and miles and how to travel for nearly free. Last episode, you heard us compare the process of redeeming points to learning the game of chess. Discuss what an award search even is and how to overcome some of the most common obstacles when searching and provide some context behind how award tickets are priced, what to look for when searching to know you're getting the best deal. This time we'll dive deeper into airline alliances and how to use them to your advantage, why transferable points are your best friend when it comes to making redemptions, the step-by-step process of booking, how to know how much value you're getting out of your points, and a few advanced strategies to help you get even more value. But before we dive into that, I'll quickly just go around the horn. How's everyone doing today? Great. Happy Tuesday. (laughs) Happy Tuesday, indeed. I don't have a a, a question to start this one off about like a law or something. So there's no pressure. I'm just generally curious how you do (laughs) it. No, I think I'm doing good. I think it was banned. Travis's law last time was that you're not allowed to do that anymore. (laughs) Oh, you're (laughs) right. You can't drop questions on us last minute. That includes this one. (laughs) <laughs> okay, well, we're going to skip that part about fighting a mongoose in a phone booth, and we're going to go straight to the main content. Let's talk about redeeming points and miles, starting with airline alliances. Now, before we get into the details of how to book an award ticket using airline partners, it's important to understand what airline alliances are and how they work. So airline alliances, put very simply, are just partnerships among groups of different airlines that are designed to help those airlines work together to better serve their customers. Now, I tried many times in the course to define this in a way that doesn't sound like it's straight out of a textbook, and I've pretty much determined that was impossible. And that last uh, description I gave you sounds a little bit like a textbook. So I do want to mention that in the course, I have this cute little gif of a text conversation between American Airlines and British Airways that I think does a better job of explaining how airline alliances work. I can't fully recreate that. But to give you kind of the basics, it shows like American Airlines texting British Airways. And it's like, yo, British Airways, like what's going on? Got a bunch of customers that want to fly to Europe. Like, can you help me out? And they're like, yeah, what's up, AA? Like, hope you're doing well. I'd be happy to help you. But can you help my customers who are flying to North America? Like, yeah, this is cool. It's a partnership. Like, do you want to call this an alliance? Like, yeah. We should have taken my... some. We should have taken some time to uh, cast each other as the different airlines. Oh, I was going to say we missed a real opportunity here to do a dramatic. I'll be British. Slash British air reading air. It. No, don't, yeah, like a don't table put me reading. To be British. Yes, <laughs> there we go. Weirdly, by the I, way, American, it's obvious, not obvious. <laughs> it's it's. It, I mean, yeah, I, like using a textbook definition feels so dry, but it's so hard. I was sitting here even trying to think. And for some reason, like every analogy I ever try to come up with for for airline alliances just sucks so bad. I was trying to think of like, oh, like you're going on a road trip with friends, but like, you know, uh, Bryce is driving, but it's technically Matt's car and (laughs) I'm just going along for the ride. (laughs) And whoever's driving determines the price of gas and you have to have the money, you know. Yeah, I can see that breaks down quickly, but yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, airline alliances, just groups of airlines that work together. I think the general idea is that it helps them cover the entire world. Uh, You know, American Airlines is partners with British and and a handful of others. And what you'll generally find is that there's not a ton of overlap between airlines in the same alliance from a geography standpoint. They kind of just like stitch together groups of airlines to help cover the entire map, if you will. So that's our that's our quick description of uh, airline alliances, but I would encourage you to check out that kind of fake text conversation that I butchered 30 seconds ago because it, I think, does a good job explaining it. Anyway, there are three main benefits that airline alliances give to you, the consumer. The first, access to more destinations via seamless reservations. That's going back to kind of what I just mentioned. Most airlines are not going to have routes that cover the entire world, right? If you want to fly American Airlines to like Southeast Asia, your options are somewhat limited. But because they're part of One World Alliance, they have other airlines in their alliance that cover those areas better than they do. And it helps you book one single ticket, but get access to the entire world. Number two, with airline alliances, a second benefit to you is that you can earn and redeem miles for any airline in the alliance. And that this is where partner award bookings come into play. We're going to dive into that a little bit deeper here in a moment. And then the last one, reciprocal elite benefits. If you have high status with, say, United but you're flying in an area of the world where United might not necessarily cover nearly as well. Travis is laughing because he does have high status United. I, I know I'm jealous ish. Uh, you can expect to have those, the type of elite benefits that you would expect on United on other airlines within the Alliance. 
So really, it's almost as if it takes the you know, 30, 40, however many airlines are in the world, and it makes it as if there are really only three major airlines for the three major alliances, which would be Star Alliance, United being the, the most familiar partner for anyone who lives in the United States, One World, that's American Airlines Alliance, and then Sky Team is the third, that would be Delta's Alliance. So those are the three main ones. Those I would guess that 85 to 90% of airlines in the world are in one of those three alliances. There are a handful of what are called non-alliance partnerships. This is kind of like a, I don't know, a temporary alliance, if you will, like a alliance light. It's like um, you're dating. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And, and actually, it, it sometimes these did lead to alliances being joined. So that's actually an apt uh, comparison there. Um, but yeah, there's, there's really fewer of these than there used to be in, in recent years past. Probably the most notable one is Etihad, where you get kind of semi-alliance benefits with some airlines, but that gets probably too deep in the weeds for this podcast. And then lastly, there's a handful of airlines that are not in any of the major alliances. These tend to be like your more budget or like super localized carriers, Southwest, Spirit, Frontier, Ryanair, et cetera. They kind of just operate completely on their own. So that's the basics of airline alliances. So, so let's let's uh, take a quick, quick game. Ooh. Uh, so Bryce, Bryce said that there's like forty to fifty airlines in the world. Without googling, since all of you are sitting at a computer, what is your guess for how many commercial airlines exist in the world? Forty-seven. Oh, 53. I'll say one hundred and seventy-three. According to my quick Google, when Bryce said that, there are 1,126 <laughs> registered commercial airlines in the world. That too. That too. Hey, I win. Off. I was the closest. Yeah, over. congrats, Woo! Matt. You win bragging rights. I have a new law to put into effect, which is <laughs> I don't want to guess how many jelly beans are in the jar without any kind of context. <laughs> yeah, especially publicly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I have to think that counts like the regional airlines where it's like Midwest Express operating as Delta kind of thing. Even smaller than that, it it probably counts like a a company that owns like two airplanes doing like safari flights in the desert or whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's based off of, yeah, registered airlines with like IATA and ICAO. So yeah, any small commercial airlines like that, definitely, definitely uh, like Transmaldivian Airways. (laughs) New one for me. Can't say I have any points with them, um, but it doesn't necessarily matter if they're an alliance because there are other avenues to go. Ding, Let's ding, talk ding. about why you should care about airline alliances, parentheses, if you're not a frequent traveler who's a consultant for work, because that's you know, a different story. But for the average person, airline alliances massively increase the value of your points and miles because they open up additional ways to redeem them that might not be obvious for most people. So I'll go back to what I kind of mentioned before. Airline alliances really make it feel as if there are only three major airlines on earth. Those are the you know Star Alliance, One World, Sky Team. Uh, so your miles are not tied just to the airline with which they share a name. So for example, uh, one partner booking that I did uh, not too long ago, I, I was able to book Qatar Q Suites using American Airline miles to fly from, I believe it's from Washington, D.C. through Doha and then down to Cape Town. Most people would completely miss that association, like using American Airlines to fly on Qatar Airways. I, I never stepped foot on an American Airlines plane. You know, I flew to regions of the world in which American Airlines generally is not uh, prominent, if you will. American um, Airlines actually doesn't operate any flights to Africa. Did not know that. There's yeah. trivia number two for this podcast. There are, what, 1,200 airlines and American Airlines does not currently fly to Africa. Um, but that's one reason, one that I've done. So I'll... Um, I'll open it up here to the group. Can you can you tell me about a, like a recent partner word booking that you've done uh, that might not be like super obvious? Yeah, so I actually uh, am using a partner word booking for a flight I'm taking in two weeks. Um, I am taking Air France flight from Denver to Paris, but I actually booked it through Virgin Atlantic. Um, and so I was able to use my chase points to transfer to Virgin Atlantic and book it for 12,000 points for an economy ticket instead of the 25,000 that it was being offered for through Air France. So it saved me like half the amount of points. It was great. Well, you're going in two weeks. I'm going in like three days. <laughs> Ooh, I, transferred, I transferred American Express points to ANA to book a United operated flight to Europe. 
it was 88,000 uh, uh, ANA miles round trip per person in business, which is like a really good option to get to Europe. I, I also like how, how Matt books United Polaris, like one of the better products out there. And he calls it a United operated flight. Yeah. <laughs> Downplaying it. I love it, sir. I'm yep. sorry, Travis, yep. go ahead. Yeah. No, I will raise for, my glass of champagne from the Polaris lounge to you, sir. Mm, indeed. <laughs> See, I actually did a weird thing. And for my Europe trip coming up, I didn't use partners. I booked them directly with the operating airline. So I'm having to kind of dig a little. So taboo. Because I was going to say my Q Suites flight that I booked with AA Miles, but then Bryce threw that one out. So I'm like really being put on the spot. Um, I think one of the better examples that I've personally done is I've booked Cathay Pacific first class with Alaska Airlines Miles. Um, it was 70,000 points um, from, I, I think, all the way from the Maldives to uh, to uh, to New York. I didn't transfer any because there's not transfer partners of Alaska miles unless you somehow have a, an old diners club card. Those are the only points that transfer, but you can't get any of those anymore. So fun uh, tidbit about your uh, booking Cathay with Alaska miles. Did you know that you could could in theory book all the way from South Africa to Hong Kong to New York for 70? I think it was 70,000 Alaska miles in uh, business on Cathay. I yeah. wanted to try that and could never find the space. It was like probably a, it was, it was definitely a unicorn, but yeah. I wanted to try and book that so bad, but could never find it. Cathay space used to be a little bit easier in first class, especially um, out of San Francisco and LA. Cause they operated like four flights a day to both of those. But ever since the pandemic, it's become a little bit more challenging. Yeah, in some regards, it almost feels like the pandemic kind of wiped most of Cathay out of the points and miles conversation, at least for folks doing what we do. Anyway, key takeaways about leveraging airline alliances to your advantage. You, you just heard a lot of unfamiliar brands, I'm guessing, unless you're a frequent flyer, and it probably sound kind of mumbo jumbo. Here's the bottom line. Most points and miles can do a lot more than you realize. You just heard us talking about using American Express points and transferring those to an airline called ANA to fly on United. Um, you know, it just, that's one example of many in which your, your points and miles can do a lot more than you think they can do, at least on the surface. And then the second point there, somewhat related, don't look past points and miles programs that might feel unfamiliar to you. You can get some of the best value out of some of these kind of more niche or unfamiliar programs, um, as you just heard us kind of talk about. So let's talk about partner airlines. That's a term for any airline that's within the same alliance. So for example, American Airlines and British Airways, they're both part of One World. They would call each other partner airlines. I believe they actually did that in that text message thing I did earlier. Anyway, um, partner airlines allow you to do partner award bookings, which is a booking where you use your points and miles from one airline in an alliance to book a flight operated by another airline in that same alliance. Sometimes these partner award bookings seems obvious and almost even accidental. So for example, if you're trying to fly from Cleveland, Ohio to London, and you just search on Google flights and, you know, you end up flying American Airlines from Cleveland to say New York City, and then you fly British Airways from New York City to London. That was technically a partner booking that you might not have even been aware of until you show up at the airport. So that's kind of the obvious ones that, uh, you know, most folks might've even encountered, but other times it's not so obvious. Kind of like some of the examples we just mentioned before, you know, flying on Qatar to South Africa using American Airlines miles, where there's really not like a kind of a natural connection that you'd be able to put together just looking at that on the surface. But generally speaking, you can use points and miles from one airline in an alliance to book a flight on any other airline in that same alliance. But, and here's the key part that a lot of people miss, the price you pay is always set by the airline that you are booking with, which is the one you have miles with, the one you're redeeming with. That is who sets the price. So for example, you can use American Airlines miles and you can book a flight with British Airways, Qantas, Qatar, any of the other handful of members of the One World Alliance, but you're going to pay the price that is set by American Airlines. Or you can use United Miles to book anything on Star Alliance, Air Canada, Turkish Air, Singapore, et cetera. But you're going to pay the price that is set by United Airlines if you're booking with their miles. We're going to kind of come back to that and kind of common mistakes here in a moment. Next thing to know. Partner award space is a limited commodity, kind of like we talked about in our last episode on, on booking 
you know, award seats using your points and miles. You can't book any seat on any airline as a partner booking with your miles. There's, they're a limited commodity as we, as we say. Um, you can generally only book a partner award ticket if there is what is called saver level award seats available on the partner airline. That term is becoming a little bit more opaque. It sometimes is called true award space, um, but it's, it's a limited commodity and there's not a ton of it depending on what you're looking to book. If there are no more saver level award seats available, you'll often just see that there's no option to book a partner award ticket. It'll just show as sold out or no seats available. And again, that will still be the case. Even if you hop on like Google flights and you see, Hey, there's still 86 seats available. Why won't they sell this to me in points and miles? That is why. Yeah. And that, that can be like a tricky thing for people to wrap their head around sometimes, especially if, you know, uh, if they go to united.com, search for an award flight on United and see that United is willing to sell you an award ticket. Then you want to book with a partner like Air Canada or Turkish Airlines and you go and you search it and you don't see it. Like there's this disconnect that people often find of, well, United was selling me the flight, but Air Canada isn't. And that's because like United will sell you any seat on any of their flights. They'll probably just charge you an astronomical amount of miles for it. But in order for it to be able to be booked with partners, it has to be at kind of that saver level or true award seat that Bryce said, which is not every seat. It's only those that are priced at generally the lowest um, award price possible. And as airlines like move to more, uh, we call it dynamic pricing. Um, in the past, there were charts and it said a saver level costs this much, a Non-saver costs, you know, 20 times the amount, whatever. Uh, it, there's a bit of a loss of transparency on that. Um, and so don't be surprised when you're starting off and searching. If you see, especially if you see the operating airline, you know, not the partner, the airline who's you're actually flying, selling that seat as an award ticket, but other airlines don't have access to it. I think there's also another level there too of, you mentioned, you know, I find the award space on United, I should book with another partner. Even more so is, hey, I found this cash flight on Google Flights, I want, how do I book that with points? Uh, and just because you find the cash fare doesn't necessarily mean it's it's available to book via points from a airline currency. You could obviously use like a travel portal in most cases, but for an actual award redemption, those don't always necessarily translate into availability. Yeah. And even one step further than that, like the cheapest cash fare is not necessarily going to be the cheapest award fare. And that's a mix up we see all the time, especially if you're traveling as a group and you've got two people who want to use points and two people who want to pay cash. You're probably not going to pick the same flight because it's not going to line up. It's not going to be the cheapest for both people. Yeah, we see that's that when, all, all the time. I was going to say, that's when you say, I'll see you there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'll airdrop you photos of my champagne while we're in flight. Yeah. That's always the best. Um, so when you're when you're looking at these these partner award searches, what we like to say is that you should apply you should approach this with what we call an airline alliance centric mindset. You remember we mentioned earlier you can generally book an award ticket on any airline within an entire partnership using miles from any airline in that partnership. So that creates situations where you might have the exact same seat on the exact same plane being sold by more than a dozen different airlines at a dozen different prices. So if you have the ability to use something like transferable miles where you have options on how to book it, it's, it's almost like comparison shopping to buy like the same TV from a different retailer that would be cheaper. You can leverage these differences in prices to save points and miles. So your mindset has to change uh, to look at any flight option first from the perspective of the airline alliance. Again, almost as if there are only three airlines in the world, Sky Team, One World, and Star Alliance. So the old mindset of, well, you know, I want to book a flight on, say, United Airlines, therefore I need United Miles. That's, that's simplistic. That ignores uh, partnerships. The new mindset with taking in airline alliances into account here is, Say, all right, I want to book a flight on United Airlines. United Airlines is a member of Star Alliance. What options do I have to book that United Airlines flight using miles from any other partner in Star Alliance? That key mindset shift, I think, is the perhaps the biggest thing to understanding how to look at award partner bookings. Yeah, and I, I, I 
I want to add that like this kind of mindset can seem tricky, but it's not anything different than, uh, you know, your pre points days when you've booked flights, like before you got into points and miles, what most people do is they want to book a flight, but they want to book it as cheap as possible. So they're looking at a variety of different websites to see which one is going to charge them the least dollars. It's the exact same thing here. You know, you you're finding it with, you're finding this award seat that's operated by one, but you're going to look at all of the different partners and the points that you have to be able to transfer to those partners to get the lowest cost. It's the exact same thing. You're just like Bryce said, you're comparison shopping with cash versus with points. Absolutely. And I, I want to ask the group here, uh, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about booking like partners award flights with alliances, there are particular sites that tend to do better than others when searching different alliances to find the award space. So, you know, what, what sites are you searching first for different alliances to try to find the best award space for a possible partner booking? For one world, I typically start with American airlines website. A majority of the time, um, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, it gives you a good picture. However, there are random times where certain partner space just doesn't show up. Like, in the last couple of years, we'll see that American just doesn't show Qatar space for like five months at a time. And then one day it magically reappears, but it works fine on like British Airways site. You can see Qatar space. So you kind of have to like be in the know a little bit, I guess, but also just rely on multiple sites. So yeah, I'll use American Airlines and just see what that shows up first. Uh, especially if I'm doing a partner booking, then I might go to confirm that space on British Airways or maybe even in Qantas, another all three kind of one world partners. Those are probably the three best uh, sites for reviewing quant uh, one world space and, and potentially even adding an expert flyer in there as well, like we talked about on a previous episode. Uh, Travis, Emily, other alliances, what, what sites do you typically use to search those? Yeah. Um, I, I, for Sky Team, I'll usually start with like Air France or KLM, um, pretty much the same exact user interface, but um, it, it's like dynamically priced most of the time, but once you kind of like get the feeling of it and you'll start to recognize like, Oh, when I see something like a business class flight is 55,000 miles, then you like will recognize that that's a saver fare and you can go and see if it's on Virgin Atlantic or Delta, um, and do that kind of double check that Matt was talking about. Um, but I think what, what's great about the like, um, sites that, that I mentioned that Matt mentioned is that, um, it's pretty easy to search multiple days. Um, especially with, with American airlines, you can see like that calendar view. It's not quite as easy with KLM and, and Air France, but you can pretty easily flip through all the different dates. So if you're being pretty flexible about when you're traveling, those are some good options. Um, I, for Star Alliance, I use United or Air Canada, um, keeping it in, in North America, apparently. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I kind of the, wanted to take uh, a quick side note, which apparently I've been doing a lot of, um, to just to highlight something um, that might not be apparently obvious. And that's that like each of us gave examples where we use two airlines. And that comes back to that verifying award space, right? Because if I search on United and I see an award seat on United for a flight that's operated by United, I can't guarantee that it's saver level. That's not fully accurate because United will actually tell you, which is a nice thing. But if I'm not sure, I can go to Air Canada to see if I see the exact same award space. And if I do, then I know that that is truly saver level space. The other reason why you want to do this, why you want to verify uh, the award space that you find, um, again, One World using British Airways and American, Sky Team, Air France and Delta, Star Alliance, United and Air Canada. One of the reasons you want to do this is because some airlines have actually started doing what they call married segment logic. And what that is, is they will show you award availability at a saver level but it only exists if you start at certain airlines. American Airlines is really notorious for this. So, right, I'm in Houston. Let's say they're wanting to steal some market share away from United in Houston. So they'll say, oh, yeah, you can fly from Houston to Dallas to London on one award ticket at a saver level rate. Sounds great, right? 
Well, it turns out they're not offering just the Dallas to London leg. They're only offering it when you add on the Houston to Dallas leg. And if you don't verify this by checking that Dallas to London leg on uh, on British Airways, then you might start to become really confused and really frustrated when you go to book it uh, with a partner and you're like, why can't I get this? I can get it on Americans website at a saver level rate. So, and hopefully you haven't transferred points at yeah. this point, already thinking that it's bookable and then you're yeah. SOL. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that would, that would be unfortunate. So that's why, like, I, I, I really want to emphasize this using two sites. It's, it's about verifying the space that you find on another site because they can add in these, uh, these married logic segments, um, to where it appears as if it's saver level space, but it's really, unfortunately not. And United kind of makes it even trickier too, because if you have one of their credit cards, they open up like more saver space for you as a card holder, but those aren't going to be book- bookable through partner airlines. So just to throw another wrench in it. <laughs> See, yeah. points of miles is super easy. It I can swear. be yes. complex, <laughs> which, yeah, I mean, the next note I have here on the, on the, agenda, you know, partner word bookings add more complexity, as you just heard. Uh, not only that, with kind of the different, uh, you know, availabilities or, or price levels that they show, but there's also like kind of some, like lower level stuff, like you'll often have to call to select seats uh, or to make like minor changes to your itinerary. You, you might not be able to complete everything online. And then lastly, you got to be aware of something called phantom award space, which is closely related to what we just heard here, where you might see that an award ticket is available on one website and I'll be like, yeah, here's your route. Here's your price. Looks good. But when you go to book that with a partner, it's just simply not available. This is, I guess you could blame it on like a technical glitch where one partner's availability is not reflecting another's. To me, it always feels like when you're in like Home Depot and you have out the app and it says they have like two boxes of these light bulbs left. And then you're talking to the person. They're like, no, we, we definitely don't. I've, I've searched the entire store. That's Phantom Award booking. Phantom award space can be so annoying. I actually had this happen to me uh, last year. Um, I had found Etihad first space, um, first class on Etihad that you can book with Air Canada. Saw it on Air Canada site. I didn't bother to verify it elsewhere because I was like, ah, it's already showing up on the partner site. Like, surely it's good. Transferred 260,000 chase points to Air Canada. Went to book it, kept getting an error, kept getting an error, <clears throat> called in, <clears throat> excuse me, sat on hold for about three hours for them to say, no, we can't, we, we're not seeing that. We're not seeing that. And that phantom space was there for months. I tried booking it multiple times over multiple months. Um, and yeah, so now because I didn't bother to verify it because I thought that I was smarter than I was. Um, I've got 260,000 points sitting with Air Canada. And since then, they've changed their award chart. So now that flight costs even more points. Um, so those miles that I transferred have been devalued. That's a, a good nuance, though, too, even about the Phantom Award space, especially with the verifies. Also, just because you see it there doesn't necessarily mean it's bookable. A lot of times you won't realize something is Phantom Space until you get one or two clicks in literally at like the checkout screen and it'll error out there. So it'll sometimes show in the calendar. You can click it, go to the next step to book, and then maybe even one more click, and then it will essentially error out. So really confusing. Yeah. And like all I would have had to have done is gone to Etihad site, run an award search there and see that they don't have it priced at a saver level and save myself from transferring the the miles. People are going to be so happy to hear that that Pros make mistakes, Travis. Yeah, it happens all the time. Yes. <laughs> have you have you used any of your two hundred and sixty thousand? Nope. Okay. Uh, uh, but I'm very close to because I need a return flight from Australia next year, and Air Canada yeah. actually opens their award chart like three hundred and fifty days out. Um, and so Singapore, Air New Zealand, who also release award inventory earlier than the standard three hundred and thirty days, you can book there. So. Um, I'm eyeing some Singapore business class seats, which are 115,000 miles per person from Australia. Nice. nice. That's within but the budget, sounds like. Indy sounds good, yeah. <laughs> Sydney to Singapore to New York for the longest flight in the world. 
I think I, I have to remember. I I know I saw it to L.A. and to to. I don't think it was to Newark. I think it was to JFK. Um, I think that'll work. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be okay. I feel like half of America had a similar Phantom Award uh, space experience this, this past, what was it, four months ago when Taylor Swift tickets dropped and you could hop on Ticketmaster and you had like four floor seats in your cart and, you know, you click to add payment info and it's like, actually, those are gone. That's what, what Phantom Award about. space is. Sounds like you're talking from personal experience here. Bruce. Yeah. Just yeah. That Can out you there. hear the saltiness coming through my voice? That was me. Um, but yeah, just a couple of final points on, on Phantom Award space. One, this is a relatively rare thing. Don't don't get over concerned that you know every other flight you see is Phantom Award space. It's it's pretty rare, and really, and, and you know everyone else, feel free to hop in here. But the, the only way to to know is to call. Right. You see a, an itinerary, you got a call, sometimes wait on hold for a long time. And once the airline tells you on the phone, like, oh, no, this is bookable right here. That's how you know that this is not Phantom Suites. You can, you can sometimes, depending on the program, find out on their site or see it on their site, but you kind of have to know because you'll get an error um, when you like attempt to go to check out online, essentially. So, you know, if, if this is your first time and you've never done it, you may not realize that's what that is. But if you've you know, kind of got the hang of it and, and found it maybe a couple of times and you can probably quickly recognize that, hey, this is probably just phantom space. Yeah. And if you see it on multiple partner sites, the odds of it being phantom space is pretty low. Um, like I think, like Bryce said, probably the most foolproof way is to call in. Um, but I'm a millennial and I hate talking on the phone. Let's go say um, it's 2023. Why are we encouraging <laughs> people to call in? <laughs> so, uh, like uh, that, that's the most foolproof way. Um, but it's not uh, like, unless it, uh, you know, I, I would probably say, unless it's like you have to travel on very specific days, you have no flexibility whatsoever. And you absolutely want to be sure before you transfer any points, call in, but, uh, Feel free, you know, y'all tell me what you do. I, I don't go through that extent when booking a word space. I just either verify it on another partner site or end up transferring 260,000 points to Air Canada that I can't <laughs> there use. There we go. See, I actually, I have an additional step here. I text a screenshot of the amazing itinerary to my wife and I say, hey, do you want to fly business class to Paris or whatever? And then I determine that it's Phantom Award space. And then I have to try to like undo that excitement and be like, You're all right, hey, listen, it's called Phantom Award Space. Like I'm not, I, I know what I'm doing, but I also made this mistake. And yeah, that's, we oh, can't sorry, help you honey, with that bit. It was actually to Paris, Texas. And I know you don't want to go there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we'll just cancel the trip. I said first class, it's economy plus, same, same, you know, it's going to be okay. Um, anyway, if you, if you haven't determined by now and listening to this podcast, this is a relatively complex subject, which is, which means that there's a lot of mis common mistakes that people make. So I want to ask everyone here to, Tell me some common mistakes that you see people encounter when they're first getting into kind of partner awards, partner availability, this topic in general. Yeah, I think a piggyback on kind of what I was saying earlier is people will think that if they find a flight in Google Flights that is bookable with cash, that they can book it with points. And that's just simply not the case. They're, they operate, you know, in, in fair buckets, essentially, to not get too technical, but like some of those are available for points and some aren't. Yeah. I think um, one other thing that we see often is um, people kind of like jump to conclusions when they hear like, oh, these airlines are partners. And then they'll assume that that means I can transfer United miles to Singapore Airlines and book something on Singapore Airlines. Just because they're, they're friends doesn't mean, <laughs> doesn't mean you can just willy nilly transfer all these different miles around. So if you have United miles, you have to book through United's website, but that doesn't mean you're just limited to United flights, United operated flights. Yeah. It's like, it's like assuming, you know, the U S and France are friends, but if you go to France and insist on paying with U S dollars everywhere, like you're probably going to get some really mean looks from a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. The French love it when you do that. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I think a common mistake I see um, is people assuming that just because some airlines in the alliance show availability means that all airlines in the alliance have access to it. There are some special partnerships, like even deeper than that level. But also what it just comes down to sometimes is that like these, you know, 
airlines that operate hundreds of thousands of flights a year, sometimes their IT infrastructure just sucks. And they're not able to see all of the same stuff that another partner is. And even if you call in like some of them, they're like, oh, if you didn't see it online, I can't book it. So even though you should be able to, in theory, book it with any partner in the alliance, that's not always the case. Yep. I'd, I'd say for me, the, the, by far the most common one I see is the assumption that the price is the same for all partners. Someone will find like a United business class flight to Europe for 60,000 United miles. And they'll say, oh, cool. That means I can definitely book it with 60,000 Singapore miles or Air Canada because they're partners. And that's not how it works. The, the price is always set by the partner with whom you're booking, the one who you're doing miles with. And it's, it is not guaranteed to be the same. And uh, I guess before we move on, I do want to to clarify for our listeners out there. I've clearly experienced a number of mistakes, had a number of issues with booking my own award flights. Um, but keep in mind that that's not the norm, right? I've been doing this for years. I've booked, I don't know how many, maybe I, I might have booked more than 100 award flights before. Who knows? And have encountered these problems three or four times. It's certainly not the norm. Um, they do happen, but don't don't necessarily go into it thinking like you're going to run into all of these problems every single time. Um, it's just through all of our years of experience, you know, between the four of us, we've probably, we've definitely booked hundreds of award flights. You're going to run into a problem eventually, um, but don't assume that it always is going to be that way. Well said, which takes us to our next section, which is closely related to partner awards, and that is transferable points and how to redeem them. Really a key component of being able to take advantage of partner award bookings, partner space is, is having options, having miles that can potentially be redeemed on many different airlines. Uh, and that's where transferable points come into play. Now, we've talked about these on a previous episode a little bit. But as a refresher, transferable points are just a type of loyalty currency that can be, you guessed it, transferred to a variety of different airlines and hotels. This makes them the most sought after types of points and miles in our hobby. The analogy that I make in the course is that transferable points are almost like a wild card in Uno. You can just decide like, hey, this can become one of a handful of different colors. Like in the case of wild card, you say, okay, I want this to be red. You can play it. Transferable points can become one of many different airline or hotel miles. And you can decide, hey, I want this you know, chase point to become a United mile. Like a redeeming a wild card in Uno, this is a one-time process. You can say, hey, I want this to be a red card, but you can't pick up a red card and say, actually, I want this to become a wild card again. You get to do it one time. Uh, so any airline miles, hotel points cannot transfer to become transferable points. It only flows in that one single direction. So how to think about redeeming transferable points? Well, when you have the points that can transfer to many different airlines and hotels, it means that you can comparison shop a little bit. Look at the price being charged for or the price charged for all of those different airlines or hotels, compare them, and then ultimately book the one that works for you by transferring to that airline or hotel. It's it's a lot like comparison shopping. This is one of those kind of points uh, in the hobby that seems to um, be difficult for people to, to internalize until you say it's no different than if you want to buy a TV and you say, okay, well, what's the price charged by Amazon? What's the price charged by Best Buy or Walmart or wherever else you'd buy that TV? Compare them and buy the cheapest one. Same thing for transferable points. Just look at a list of the transfer partners that's usually right there in your bank account, or you can just Google it. Run a quick search on each one, compare the prices, and then you'll know which one's going to be the best. Um, so the step-by-step -step process is pretty straightforward. Just make a list of all the transfer partners, run an award search for each applicable one, and write down the results. And I say applicable because at some point you'll figure out that you don't have to run a search on Southwest if you want to you know, book a flight to Africa uh, or you, know, you don't have to run airline searches if you're looking to book a hotel, et cetera. But search each applicable one. You also want to search the travel portal, which isn't something we've talked about a whole lot here. So to quickly touch on that, each type of transferable points program typically has what, like a travel portal, which is kind of like a glorified travel website where you can search for any sort of travel and you can book it redeeming your points at a fixed value generally like one to 1.5 cents per point you always want to check that as a check step but what you'll find is that as you're booking kind of more and more expensive travel 
uh, more like high-end luxury travel, the odds of the portal being your best move go down. But we did highlight in a previous episode how Travis got an awesome trip to Indonesia, I believe it was, by booking through MX Travel. He so did. they do happen. Yeah, don't exclude them, but it's the exception, not the norm. Precisely. Yep. And then just choose the best option and book it. You know, ultimately the choice is up to you. There's really no right or wrong answers. All that matters is that you considered every option and you chose the one that you wanted. So I'll put it back to the group here again for a quick question. What do you look for when you're, uh, you know, evaluating award flights, particularly like when, when using transferable points? Uh, I start with what options are even available. <laughs> Sometimes there might only be one choice and that's what it is. Um, but assuming I have options to pick from, it's generally a balance of convenience, quality of the flight, um, and like how many points. Um, to me, uh, you know, the convenience is probably the one that I'm more likely to throw to the wayside. Um, and I think my recent like flight with a like 20 hour layover in Sri Lanka and then like 22 hours in Dubai speaks to that. Um, so for, for me, yeah, convenience is probably the least, um, the quality of the flight experience is, is, is number one for me. Of course, I've got a little bit more flexibility with my work to work remotely on an airplane. Um, it might even be encouraged sometimes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh uh yeah other, otherwise like the the quality of the flight experience ranks really really high for me yeah i think that's something that like develops as you get more experienced in the the hobby because coming from like the award booking service and seeing how people like submit their requests a lot of people who are new come in and they're like convenience is the most important thing like i want a direct flight and i don't want anything else and as you like start running your award searches, you'll kind of realize that that that's something you kind of have to like move down a few pegs if you want to have like a good flight experience or like a good cabin class and and that type of stuff. So just be prepared out there, people, to maybe sacrifice the the convenience a little yeah. bit. <laughs> Although sometimes like I do get I do question myself about whether, you know, flying for four days to get back home when I could do it in one and a half is really worth it. Um, personally, I've always found it worth it, but like these priorities can change over time. Like my wife very much prioritizes convenience because she has fixed time off. So like missing an extra two days of work just to fly yeah. a specific flight, like doesn't really fly uh, for her pun intended, I guess. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I think what Travis said was was key here was, uh, you know, start and just see what your options are and then kind of work your way backwards from there. You might run a search and have literally three options and then you just kind of got the best of it and, and accept that. But you may also find a search to where you've got 25 options and you have a lot of different variety you can choose from. It's totally going to depend based on time of year, seasonality, how far in advance you're booking, the route, all that kind of stuff. So literally just getting a starting point and then working backwards from there. So for me, I'm going to factor in maybe repositioning if I need to. You know, if I'm flying home from London, but I can quickly hop over to Paris to get a much better flight, I might actually consider that if the layover time is less or the the product is different or better or, you know, works better for my schedule, all that kind of stuff. So flexibility, ultimately, once you've kind of um, established what your options are, are generally what I look at and then figuring out, okay, like, Basically, which points do I feel like spending? And you know, how can I book some of this stuff too once I've sort of found my options as well? Yeah, it really just comes down to that kind of comparison shopping that we talked about before. Just look at all your options. There's no right answer. There's no calculation that you can do to say like, it's this. You just you got to explore, compare things, and make a decision. Transferable points is also a perfect fit for something Emily just mentioned, our award booking service. Like We can do this for you. If you're still not sure how to redeem points and miles or candidly, you just don't want to put in the time and effort to do so, you can sit back and leave it to the experts by taking advantage of our award booking service. We handle a few hundred of these a month. We've done over a thousand of them total. It's, it's truly just like approaching a, an expert at like a Sudoku puzzle and saying like, here's my Sudoku puzzle, like solve this for me. 
and we will do that for you. You don't have to worry about all this whole, is it Phantom Award space? Like, how do I book this? Like, how do I run searches to kind of triangulate the award availability? We have, you know, some of the best points and miles minds in the world who will do that for you. More details on that linked in the show notes or at 10xtravel.com slash award dash booking. Next topic, choosing a class of service. Now, this is something that might not be as easy as most people think when they when they start out, because I think most uh, flyers are used to kind of the conventional domestic uh, airline setup where you have kind of like, you know, first class or business class, which is just like maybe eight to 10 seats in the front of the plane, they're angle flat, and then you have economy thereafter. But when we're talking about like international bookings, there can be a lot more nuance to that. So let's quickly talk about different types of classes of service and what to look out for. In general, every airline is going to have about two to five different cabin classes. Typically, those are first class, business class, premium economy or economy plus or the many other names that goes by and economy. Starting from the best one first, that's the highest and the most expensive. This is going to be the best seats on the plane. They're usually right up front. Uh, there might be on some planes as, as few as like eight first class seats up to maybe 16 on some of the larger planes. It's going to be the most expensive in terms of both cash and points. And this is where you're going to see some of this kind of aspirational type of seats where you have like your own little apartment or, you know, Matt recently flew Singapore Airlines first where... I don't even know how I, how I would describe that. It's like a almost like a room. It was a room. Um, there was a closing door and r- lots of room to move around. It was it was an apartment in the sky, but not the apartment. I was gonna say that's. I think that's a trademark <laughs> term. Um, yes. So that's first, and th- and that's first again on on international routes with with uh, with domestic. It's a little bit different. And it's so important bel- to note here that that there are very few true first class products that still exist. Um, and and we'll get maybe into the nuances of like domestic first versus international first class. But generally, when we're talking about first class, we're talking about international first class. And there are only a handful of airlines still operating those kinds of products. And really, it's almost so exclusive that the average traveler doesn't even like walk through that cabin when you're boarding. Like you probably have never seen this before other than like on Instagram or, you know, on the Internet. That's first. So business is the second highest class of ticket. But really, if if there's only two t- classes on a plane, it's the top class. Uh, the amenities of business can vary greatly uh, by airline or even like type of plane that you're flying on. Sometimes it's just a little bit more legroom and kind of like an angle flat seat. Sometimes it's a whole like lie flat kind of pod type setup where you still have like premium food choices. You know, your food is still served on glass plates with you know metal silverware it truly can vary quite a bit. Um, so it, when, when booking business class travel, I, I highly encourage people just Google like the plane type in the airline and then business review, you know, like American Airlines, you know, 777 business review, because it can be dramatically different. And you certainly wouldn't want to spend all of your hard-earned points and miles and get on a, a product that you're not super excited about. One below business would be premium economy. This would generally feature standard airplane seats, but with more legroom. Um, this class of service will often come with better food and beverage and priority boarding as well, but not always. And then lastly is economy. I think most people are familiar with economy. It's the lowest class available. It's the one that most people are familiar with. It's standard flying, if you will. And I suppose there's one level even below that basic economy, which is the same physical seat, same cabin as economy. There's just more restrictions on your ticket and other types of amenities. So oftentimes you might not get to select a seat. You might not get to check a bag. Um, You might have to pay an additional fee to bring a carry-on. Basic economy effectively makes every airline on earth into a budget airline, where if you're doing anything other than walking onto the plane with the clothes on your back and flying, uh, you will probably expect to pay a little bit more. You know, there there might actually be a better deal than basic economy, and it's called stowaway. It's where you sneak on and don't pay anything. And the mm-hmm. best thing is if you get caught, you'll probably get like free room and board and meals for quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, gate, gate check yourself. That's and one level. It below. doesn't require any points either. <laughs> <laughs> Just an oxygen check. <laughs> um, so yeah, really there's, there's two reasons why you want to make sure you understand the difference between these, these types of cabins. Uh, the first is that first in business class on international flights is often dramatically different than first or business class that you see on domestic flights. There's really no way that any sane person would pay like two to three times the price for like a slightly bigger seat and some complimentary food and drinks um, for some of these true first class products. Um, And, you know, many people who are new to the hobby have this kind of mindset of 
paying more for first or business class is crazy. Like what a waste of points. You could use them to take multiple trips in economy. Like, I don't know why anyone would ever do that. And while it's not necessarily wrong, I can tell you that many people who try first or business class, especially on an international long haul flight, will end up coming back usually to our award booking service and saying, okay, I can only fly business first class now. I can see why it's more expensive. Once you turn left, you never go back is what a lot of people will say. Yeah. I, I, I do want to add, like, if you've never flown these before, um, and we see this a lot in the award booking service, people will say they want first class. And a lot of times, like, the amenities you want when you think of first class are exactly what you get in business class. Um, so don't write off business class. Um, there are some incredible business class products. There are some business class products that I would fly over certain first class. Um so don't necessarily like if you're listening to this and be like, I really want to use mine for for first class because you're like, it's totally not a waste of points when I could use them to take multiple trips in economy. Um, don't get too hung up on the first versus business class distinction. Yes, there are some incredible first class products out there, but for 99% of you who are listening to this, and I'd probably go so far as to say 100% who have never flown business or first class on an international long haul trip, what you think when you say first class is the experience you'll get in business class. So don't foreclose the opportunity to fly business class either. Yeah. It's most people, you, you, you said exactly right. They, they, they're picturing business class when you say first, because business class on those international long haul routes, it's, it's champagne before you board. It's a live flat seat. It's usually kind of a private pod type setup. First class gets into like caviar, like an actual fresh flower, like, you know, on the side of your seat, like just a level of service that, that most have really never seen before. Yeah. Potentially so, a shower. <laughs> yeah. In one case or, you know, a bar there's, you know, yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's pretty wild out there. So I, I guess let, let's, I want to ask all of you here, how, how do you kind of think about choosing the, the class of service when you're deeming points? What, you mean there are classes of service other than business and first class to book? <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't paying attention Nailed for the last it. four or five minutes. No. <laughs> um, uh, for me, domestic, I, I, I mean, yeah, I would love to say I book like domestic first class or business class internationally for everything, but that's not the case. For domestic flights, like under two or three hours, you know, I'll probably book economy most of the time. If there is a reasonable option to book a premium cab, like, you know, first domestic first through like a transfer partner or something, I'll, I'll look at that and see if that's an option, you know, for something, especially like two, three hours plus would love to be um, upfront or at least economy plus, like I'll maybe pay, uh, buy an economy seat with miles and then maybe pay to, you know, to the economy plus or whatever you call it fee to sit there just for the leg room. Um, but Yeah international it would at this point would take me a lot to uh fly economy which i know sounds absurd but it doesn't it's sound just, absurd it's just, to me it's just the point that i'm in i'm for non points of miles people but yes and let me ask you a quick follow-up on that matt were, were you ever in the camp of like i don't understand why anyone would, would pay for premium cabin no i don't think so um I've you know always like kind of aspired to be like yeah I want to always just book first class or what I thought was first class but you know was actually business class um, was never really like I can't believe people pay for that no I've gotcha. always I've always wanted to just had to kind of work your way up to that level for sure gotcha Travis Emily how do you think about that yeah I'm I'm uh, I'm very similar to Matt um, for me points and miles are an opportunity to experience things that I wouldn't otherwise pay for. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to where I could buy an economy ticket most anywhere I wanted to go, um, you know, so long as the prices are reasonable. Um, but like business and first class, those prices are insane. I mean, when you're talking $3,000 plus for a business class ticket, or I'll probably say like $6,000 plus for a first class ticket, like, that is a lot of money to spend for for a flight. So for me, my miles, my priority is first in business class on international travel. But when it comes to domestic, um, and I say domestic, I live in Houston. So domestic includes like Mexico, the Caribbean, Central America, like really anything like where I'm not leaving the continent. 
Um, I guess is probably a better way. Um, economy's fine, you know. Um, and again, very similar to Matt. I'm not gonna not use my points for first class on a domestic flight, but uh, only if it's a marginal difference. You know, if I'm paying 10,000 points for economy or I can get the same flight for 15,000 f- points and sit up front and it's a reasonable time, you know, not uh, Houston to Dallas, then yeah, I'll, I'll spend the extra 5,000 points for for the little bit of extra comfort. But most of the time for those shorter, you know, three, four, I didn't probably go so far as to say five hour flights. <laughs> Um, doing doing it in economy doesn't doesn't bother me. That did remind me of a uh, sorry to interject, but that did remind me of an absurd domestic redemption I made a couple of years ago that I should admit. But I paid fifty five thousand American Airlines miles to buy, fly from San Francisco to Charlotte on a red eye overnight so that I could fly up front just so that I could sleep because I literally had no other option and I was not going to fly a, a economy um, like red eye. Because it was on the back end of a trip coming home, and I was just going to be exhausted, and so that was a situation. Where I was like, I don't care. I know this is absurd, but I'm still booking it. And I was on that trip with you, and I believe I paid fifty five thousand Delta miles for a one way red eye first class first class ticket for the same reason. Like you know, the value of sleep sleep yep. per mile is you know could be a fun calculation. But <laughs> uh, anyway, Travis, I wanted to ask: Are you were you ever in the camp of why do people redeem? for premium cabin? No. Um, in fact, I literally got started in points and miles so that way I could fly like business or first class on my honeymoon. So, um, yeah, nope, never a question for me. It was very easy from the start. That being said, I do like to clarify that I have flown a decently long time in economy. Um, I flew from Salt Lake city to Honolulu, which was like a little over six hours. Um, in economy on Delta. And I did book that with miles actually. So um, shocking as it may be, um, it actually wasn't that bad. And and I, I, I actually like weirdly have found myself considering again, I haven't done this yet, um, but like considering sometimes I'm like, uh, like, you know, if I was going to Europe and flying out of like New York or Boston where the flights like only six to seven hours, like, economy is probably not that bad especially if i can get an extra legroom seat you know when we're talking 30 ish thousand points maybe even less versus like 50 to 60 not that i've actually booked it but i have weirdly found myself sometimes considering it and i think that just kind of comes with like the novelty of flying business first class has kind of worn off um there are times when i certainly still get excited about it and it feels very absurd to say but it 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 the novelty has worn off um and i do find myself <laughs> thinking that i'll step down sometimes and then i book business class anyway so yeah, for yourself, we have to, any time before a trip coming up that i'm flying in a premium cabin i can't sleep the night before because i'm so good <laughs> <laughs> we have to go to Emily. I see her kind of chuckling. <laughs> Emily is still, she's still in the camp of hasn't done the, the international yeah. premium cabin. So how do you think about this, Emily? And then also I'd be curious for you to react to Travis's previous comments. <laughs> yeah. I mean, would love to get to the point where I'm just not excited to fly business class anymore. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I will raise uh, Travis's six hours in economy to Honolulu with my 10 hour flight back in economy from Paris no, to no, Denver. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm flying economy to, to Europe in like a couple of weeks. So um, I'm still, I'm still good with it, but I, like we've talked about before, like I haven't tried the better option yet. So I don't, I, I know what I'm missing because I can see it everywhere, but I haven't actually experienced it yet. Um, but would love to, I'm getting there. There were, I was looking, um, a couple of days ago and there was like a business class option on the same flight that I've already booked an economy coming back. But sometimes like the taxes and fees are just like hard to swallow on some of those. Like, okay, I, I'm trying to book this like mostly free trip, but now I'm going to pay like $700 a person to, uh, it's like not bad when you consider what you're getting for that in business class, but sometimes it's a little hard to get over the hump. <laughs> I have a question for you, Emily. Mm-hmm. So on your trip in a couple weeks in economy, you go to check in and they're offering an upgraded business class for $300. Do you take it? Yeah. 
four hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah. Do you take it? For sure. Am, am I at a game right where's now? Where's the, where's, the, where's the limit? Yes. <laughs> well, I was looking. So I'm flying um, United on the way out. We have a layover in in Newark, and we're flying to to Lisbon. And I was looking at how much it would cost to upgrade from economy to Polaris, and it's like thirteen thousand dollars a person after I've already spent thirty thousand points. And I was like, <laughs> how? Dog. Where's I mean, the math that's, for that? That's what like a five and a half hour flight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Interesting. no. Interesting. That math does not make sense. Like, do you ever Something calculate like how much how much you're paying per hour to be in your seat? <laughs> That's a metric a lot of people actually use when they're factoring yep. in upgrade costs, like yeah. a check in. Actually, yep. yeah, yeah. It's like, would I pay forty dollars an hour to have a bed for on this you know ten hour flight? Yes, I would. Would I yeah. pay four hundred dollars? Well, I don't know, maybe. But then when you break it down by hour, it's like absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I do want to add a fair disclosure to what to some of you might seem like absolutely insane and ridiculous comments. I'm like six and a half feet tall. And I think that that factors in a lot into my perspective. Like, I get it. I get it that like flying and being cramped sucks for everyone. Like when I can't even move my legs at all from the position I'm in and considering that for multiple hours, it's, it's, it's tough. It's, it's I'm really going to start tough. telling people that I'm six and a third foot tall. Cause that sounds way more <laughs> sophisticated than six foot four. So I'm six and a third. I go. like that. Love it. Yeah. I guess for, for me with the one thing, quick thing I'll add, the more I do this, the more I, and pretty much exclusively flying over oceans in premium cabin. It just becomes hard not to. I think there's another component there too. As you kind of earn more and more points over time, you know, it, it's hard to part with 80% of your entire points and miles net worth to book a single business class flight. But when you accumulate like a nice little points nest egg and you're like, well, would I get rid of 10% of my total points to fly business class? Yeah, absolutely. So that changes the dynamic. And then a second quick thing, a thought that I had the other day is that, you know, that you've kind of like made it, if you will, flying business first class, when you complete your first one of those flights without taking a single picture, like of your seat or your food or anything, like you just did it and you didn't document it. Never nope, going to happen. Instagram stories are for never yeah. going to happen. <laughs> Fair enough. Maybe that's a me thing, um, <laughs> but that's yeah. So anyway, we, we mentioned real quick about you know, calculating the, the dollars per hour for upgrade which is similar to a concept in points and miles called cents per point. I'll cover this kind of briefly because really at, at 10X Travel, we don't emphasize this very heavily, although you do see it throughout the rest of the points and miles space. Some people take it very far, um, but to just kind of quickly introduce the concept, cents per point is a quick calculation that you can do to determine like if you're roughly getting a good deal on points and miles. I'll tell you how to do that in a minute, but first I want to share the, the analogy I used to explain this in the course is a Starbucks free drink or like Starbucks stars. You know, I think everyone kind of gets like a, a, a cringe feeling in their, in their mind when it's like, yeah, you see someone redeem like enough stars for a free drink and they get like a small coffee or like a croissant or something. You're like, wait a second, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been better to save those for, you know, the double mocha frappuccino that you'd normally get and instead pay cash here. You know, there's a certain level of Starbucks stars per drink price where it, it makes sense to redeem your stars versus keep them. Cents per mile is really the same way. Uh, the way that you calculate this is you take the dollar price of the flight that you're booking, you divide it by the number of points or miles required to book that flight, and you get a cents per mile figure, which you can in theory use to determine roughly if you're getting a good deal. Now, it's hard to really draw benchmarks on cents per mile, like, oh, if it's over this, it's good. If it's under this, it's bad. Because it's really just like a spectrum and it, it depends on a lot of other things kind of going on in your life and your points and miles strategy as to whether it's good. But cents per mile is kind of a good sanity check, if you will, to make sure that you're not redeeming, you know, the equivalent amount of points that could have got you a first class flight to Japan for a, you know, a domestic business class flight from Houston to San Francisco. So again, to, to do that calculation, you just take the cash price of the flight, which you often have to look up elsewhere, divide it by the number of points that are required to book that flight. And that's going to show you your cents per point. Now at 10X Travel, we encourage you to use this exclusively to determine, should I use points for this or should I consider paying cash and save my points for a later date? No different than, should I buy this coffee with cash and save my Starbucks stars for later? Where I think that this can kind of get a little bit off the rails is when people start using cents per point as some sort of comparison metric. 
you know, you can book A and A first class for you know, 110 to 100, you know, 30,000 points round trip. That ticket might cost like $18,000 if paid with cash. So people will kind of walk around beating their chest like, yes, 12 cents per point. Like that's an amazing redemption. And like from that purely mathematical standpoint, sure it is. But you always have to factor in like, how do you use points and miles that best suit you? Like if you go out and you chase the best cents per mile, you can do that. And you might book some really high end flights. But optimizing for that first is the wrong approach because you're just going after something to say that you save more money. Our opinion is just use it to determine, should I consider paying cash for this flight and saving my points? And, and real quick, cents per point, cents per mile, these are kind of used interchangeably because really in the hobby, points and miles, those terms are used somewhat interchangeably. Uh, please know that I'm referring to the same thing when I say cents per point or cents per mile. The only other thing I was going to add into is a lot of times when people have these really aspirational redemptions, they'll say like, I saved $18,000 by using points, but like, were you ever really going to spend $18,000? Probably not. So like sometimes what I'll do if I'm like figuring out how much I really saved is like, okay, well, here's what the ticket I, I would have paid for costs. So like maybe it's a round trip economy ticket to Europe for like $800. And I used points. So then like I'll use that cash value to calculate the cents per point or just like estimate how much I'm saving rather than saying, wow, like here's a business class flight that was gonna be fifteen thousand dollars and thank God I saved all that money. Now I can put a down payment on a house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I people I I've found that um People, and I've done this in the past, are guilty of inflating their cents per point. Um, and it's not that like you're being wrong or misleading, but kind of like Emily said, would you really pay that? Right. If I searched for the exact specific flight that I booked with points, one way, because usually I'm booking two one ways, the odds of that being the cheapest flight on that day is really low. In fact, the odds of it being the highest cost is, or, you know, in the top half is more. And so if I look for that very specific flight and it costs $7,000, you know, to fly from Houston to London, and I use that to calculate my cents per point versus I look at what the cheapest is during that time. And the cheapest option is $1,500. If I was actually paying for a business class flight to London, would I pay the $7,000 or the $1,500? Most likely, I'd pay the $1,500. Um, and I, I especially think as we're, we're transitioning um, into, I'm, I'm going to say it, guys, a post-COVID era, um, <laughs> uh, that cents per point are actually becoming more and more meaningless as for anything other than just a minimum value. And the reason I say this is because like during COVID and obviously even well before COVID, like flight prices were incredibly cheap. Like you could routinely get business class tickets to Europe from the U S for under $2,000. I just checked um, from Houston over the next six months, what the cheapest flight is to Europe. And most of them are all over three grand. So like those prices for flights have crept up, which means that your, your average cents per point, the average value of your redemption is going to go up as well. And that's why to me, how I'd like to advise people to think about it is, um, and this is kind of just reframing how Bryce put it is, is a minimum value. Like what's the minimum value you want to get for your points. If you're getting more than that, good deal. Otherwise you're way overthinking it. You're, you know, I've literally seen people question whether or not they should book a flight because they're only getting six cents per point when they saw someone else getting 10 cents per point. And both of those are extraordinarily good values. And that's why I've personally changed to a, um, to a, a minimum point value. I say, what's the minimum I want to get for these points? Is it one and a half cents or two? And so long as my flight or my hotel or whatever is more than that. Cool. I'll book it. I might not be getting the highest value all the time, but it, it reframes it in a way that makes it less likely for me. It, it reframes it away from, an, am I getting a good value to, am I getting a better value than I want? And if the answer is yes, then it's easy to pull the trigger. 
Love it. There was a there was a period in time where at 10x Travel we were trying to make smiles per mile a thing. And we were like, it doesn't matter what the cost was. How many smiles did you get out of redeeming those miles? And then that was received exactly how you probably think it was. <laughs> lots of eye rolls, lots of like, dude, what? So still probably helpful to be aware got of. almost sued by Turkish Airlines. Yeah, I was going to oh, say. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Between that and what is it, Lufthansa's sm- smiles and more, miles and more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the bottom line really with this episode and the one prior to it is everyone has to crawl before they can run. Learn the basics of award searching before you try to replicate a super complex booking that you've seen someone else make, like someone in the Facebook group. When searching for award flights, you are shopping for a limited commodity and the prices are unpredictable. The entire process is a bit like solving a puzzle. You generally have to choose two of three between travel dates, destination, and award price or value. Knowing how the system works will make you informed and lead to better outcomes understanding pricing models, airline alliances, partner bookings, calculating the value of the redemption. The only way you're going to get all this is through practice. So practice, practice, practice. When anytime you have a down moment, you're watching Netflix in the evening, just run a couple of word searches just to get the hang of it. But most importantly, you can do this. The people who you see doing these incredible redemptions, you know, on our website with reader success stories or in the Facebook group, like at one point in time, felt exactly like you do right now, where this is all super complex and way beyond anything they ever thought they'd learn. And they picked it up. And I know that you can do the same. We are here to help in any way that we can. To kind of wrap things up here, you know, if you're feeling information overload at the end of this episode, don't worry. This is an episode as well as the episode before this that you can listen to multiple times and repeat certain sections until it clicks. And of course, you can consult our free course for additional material on this. Redeeming points and miles is where 99% of people in this hobby get stuck. But now you're armed with the information you need to make a successful redemption. It can be daunting to take this step in the points and miles hobby. So if you need support, we've got resource options available for you. You can reference our free course, which I mentioned, includes all the content we talked through today, kind of laid out with examples, a little bit more in depth. You can check out our Facebook group, 10X Travel Insiders, linked in the show notes. It's a great place to source help if you're stuck after running some award searches or watch how other people are doing it. Our website, 10xtravel.com, has articles that break down how to book flights, using specific specific frequent flyer programs. And if you're stuck to the point where you feel like you can't do it on your own, we do have an award booking service staffed with experts ready to help you find your best redemption available. Thank you everyone for listening. We will catch you next time on Takeoff, a points and miles podcast by 10X Travel. <laughs>